airing first on Asheville FM in Asheville, North Carolina. This is The Final Straw, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian broadcast and podcast emanating out of occupied Jalagi land in southern Appalachia. It's lonely being here On the wrong side of the law Resisting state repression and surveillance is one of the cornerstones of the Final Straw Radio and has been since the beginning of this project. Over the years, we've featured interviews with support committees, political prisoners, defendants in ongoing cases, incarcerated organizers, jailhouse lawyers, radical legal workers, and lawyers, and others to talk about how power strikes at those who it fears constitutes a threat. For those of us caught up in cases, navigating self-defense through the courts, penal system, and mainstream media can be treacherous as we attempt to balance our political and personal goals with our lawyer's desire to have us do as little time and pay as little money to the courts as possible. Winning in those, winning in those circumstances can sometimes seem to pit a well-meaning lawyer or legal worker against their own client. Enter to the scene the Tilted Scales new book, Representing Radicals. This week, you'll hear from Jay from the Tilted Scales Collective to talk about this new book, Representing Radicals, from AK Press and the Institute for Anarchist Studies, about anti-repression work, about this book's attempt to shift the culture of legal representation by intervening with arguments by radical lawyers, and more intimately inviting clients and their supporters into the fray, about movement media, about support committees, and about new frameworks for approaching cases. You can find their guide for defendants and other resources, as well as their contact, at TiltedScalesCollective.org. You can hear our 2017 interview with members of Tilted Scales about their defendants' guide linked in our show notes and at our website by searching the phrase Tilted Scales. And you can follow the group on Instagram and Twitter. In about a week, a transcript of this interview will be up at our website for free download linked alongside of others as well as printable zines of each of those, which you can find at tfsr.wtf slash zines. And now some words from anarchist prisoner Sean Swain. What you say, what you say, what you say, what? August 25th, I had my fourth parole hearing. I went up for parole in 2005, then 2011, then 2016, and then this past Wednesday. I've been in prison 30 years. In 1991, I killed a man who broke into my home. It was an act of self-defense, not a crime. But the guy who broke into my home was the nephew of the clerk of courts. He had a history of violent criminal behavior. He had tried to kick his pregnant girlfriend down the stairs, had lit her hair on fire, and had beaten her up, but had been careful not to punch her in the stomach, which means he had great self-control while beating up the people he loved. When cops responded, he fought them too, getting stunned several times with a stun gun. Thing is, he didn't spend a day in jail because his aunt, the clerk of courts, had connections to make his troubles disappear. This gave him something of a sense of entitlement, I imagine, the sense that he could even kick in doors and intimidate people and get away with it. No consequences. When he kicked in my door and reached for what I believed was a gun, I panicked. I stabbed him several times, killing him. I was arrested for the first time in my life. I became the first murder suspect in Ohio released on a $2,000 bond payment since 1929, and I didn't run. I took and passed a polygraph. But the fix was in because a family with political connections that I didn't have wanted their pound of flesh. So 
So police covered up the break-in, and the prosecutor, Kevin Baxter, solicited perjury from the medical examiner, who testified that I stabbed the man from behind. Not until the retrial with the police photos of break-in damage surfaced, now posted on Instagram at Swaniac1969, not until another medical examiner came forward did the state's medical examiner change her whole story and admit that the man who broke into my home had to be facing me when I stabbed him. After I was found guilty at retrial, Prosecutor Kevin Baxter said to his assistant, It takes a good prosecutor to convict a guilty man. It takes a great prosecutor to convict an innocent one. I got this guy twice, so what's that make me? Despite being the costliest case in Erie County history, the judge sentenced me to the minimum allowed by law, 20 years to life, and said she expected me to serve 12 years before I would be released on parole. I now have in 30 years, so it seems her math was as bad as her judgment. I became parole eligible in 2005. Since that time, the parole board has continued me in five and six year increments for a variety of ever-changing reasons. On one occasion, an official I was suing named Gary Croft was added to the parole board a month or two before my hearing and was removed just a few months after he gave me five more years. In 2013, former ODRC counsel Trevor Clark subjected me to inappropriate sexual touching and provided me home addresses to Ohio lawmakers during a bizarre interrogation that he claimed to be performing on behalf of the FBI. After I reported the sexual touching and the privacy violation of lawmakers, Trevor Clark made it his mission to make sure I would never get out of prison. He repeatedly manufactured disciplinary frame-ups to turn me into a terrorist on paper so that the parole board would see me as dangerous. In 2018, I sued Clark and one of his minions for carrying out this campaign of state terror. Weeks later, Clark ordered his minion to toss me in the hole. They then contrived an accusation that I wrote an article online that wasn't mine, and they attributed to me what they characterized as extortive language in a conversation that, admittedly, neither one of them even heard. So, the irrational prison lawyer who grabbed my junk and shared lawmakers' sensitive information with a convicted felon, after learning he got sued, engineered disciplinary action and retaliation, making accusations he knew weren't true. I was found guilty by the serious misconduct panel, but the serious misconduct panel's guilty finding was reversed. No subsequent serious misconduct panel was convened in this matter. Fast forward, and I appeared before the Ohio Adult Parole Authority this past Wednesday. I had a place to live, a job lined up, lots of community support, and I had 30 years in for an act of self-defense, 18 years longer than the sentencing judge had expected me to serve. Lauren had bought clothes for me hanging in her bedroom closet. My 76-year-old mom had been folding napkin swans for the celebration of my homecoming over the holidays. We were hopeful. The parole board recently began releasing a higher number of prisoners, including multiple child rape offenders and one prisoner who was convicted of raping and murdering an elderly woman. They couldn't possibly deny me, right? On Wednesday, the parole board continued me for five more years until August 2026. This was based in large part on the reverse serious misconduct panel decision, which they indicated was the basis for my transfer to Virginia. And just to be clear, this is the first time anyone indicated to me that I was sent to Virginia for this reason. They used words like dangerous and serious and threats. Despite the fact that I may be the only prisoner in Ohio penal history who has served 30 years without so much as an accusation of a single act of violence and they relied upon a reversed disciplinary finding that originated from an irrational sex-offending official 
who instituted the disciplinary charges against me as retaliation for me suing him. And he no longer even works for the prison system. I'm not sure, but I think they're emulating Cersei from Game of Thrones. Or maybe Joffrey. I'm starting to get the distinct impression that these people don't like me very much. So, we've retained attorney Eric J. Allen, who has successfully sued the parole board repeatedly. And we got the money through fundraising, through donations from lots of amazing people who probably could not afford to give, but did anyway. Now we're trying to raise funds for the remainder of his fees in what may prove to be the epic battle between the forces of liberation and the evil oppressors, the biggest battle since maybe the death of Iron Man. Swaniacs across the Midwest are now planning the 2021 Swaniac Fest, which is going to be held in the Toledo area, scheduled for September 23rd, featuring live music, free food, and all kinds of Swaniac memorabilia, including newly designed Swaniac t-shirts, and I even heard a rumor that my new book is going to be tabled there. Lauren Swain will be speaking. When I shared the news of this decision, Lauren said, The enemy thinks that by grinding us down, they weaken and then break us. They don't know that what they're really doing is sharpening us. So feel free to attend the Swaniac Fest in person or watch it in streaming online. Updates will be posted on Instagram at Swaniac1969, and I'm sure Burst knows more about how to contribute for my legal defense than I do. We don't get weaker, we get sharper. This is anarchist prisoner Sean Swain, an exile from Ohio at Buckingham Correctional in Dillwyn, Virginia. If you're listening, you are the resistance. You can write to Sean Swain by addressing letters to Sean Swain, number 201-5638, Buckingham Correctional Center, P.O. Box 630, Dillwyn, Virginia, 23936. You can find his past writings, recordings of his audio segments, and updates on his case at seanswain.org, or now follow him on Twitter at at Swain Rocks. Would you please introduce yourself with any names, pronouns, affiliations, or references that would help the listeners orient themselves? Sure. My name is Jay. I use they, them pronouns. And I've been a part of the Tilted Scales Collective since 2017 and involved in anti-oppression organizing more broadly over the past decade or so. Would you talk a bit about Tilted Scales, who constitutes its membership, and what sort of activities it gets up to? Sure. We're a pretty small collective of anarchist legal support workers who have spent years supporting and fighting for political prisoners, prisoners for and politicized prisoners, mostly in the so-called United States. The Tilted Scales Collective was formed out of the Anarchist Last Rock Conference in 2011, um, out of the need to build anti-oppression infrastructure more broadly. What folks were noticing was a sort of like reinventing of the wheel every time folks in the United States got hit with serious charges. Yeah, and there was a need to kind of like pull together or like draw on resources and experience to kind of like rebuild some infrastructure for providing legal support. So our collective has written two books. The first book is called A Tilted Guide to Being a Defendant, which was published in 2017. And we recently published a follow-up book called Representing Radicals. And, and that's what I'm going to be talking about a little bit more today. We also have done trainings and workshops about anti-oppression organizing as well as participated in numerous committees and legal support efforts over the years. Cool. And for, I guess, for folks that are unfamiliar with anti-repression work, like mm -hmm. a, a lot of our listeners have heard various like conversations on this show about it. And those who have been with us for a long time may even remember a chat with folks from your collective about about the defendant's guide when it came out. Mm -hmm. um, but could you could you talk a little bit about the framework of anti-repression work or any of the cases that your collective has participated in, like helping offer support for? Sure. So I guess, you know, the idea behind anti-oppression work, anti-oppression organizing, is that repression from the state is kind of an inevitable part of making change or uh, you know, like building the world we want or destroying this one, et cetera. And like rep repression of some kind is going to be inevitable. People are going to get hit with criminal charges. So 
anti-repression organizing seeks to, at baseline, um, do some harm reduction around negative outcomes of criminal charges, um, but also like use the fact that folks, maybe one person or a group of individuals are facing charges um, as kind of a, a vehicle for movement organizing or building bonds of solidarity and like coming out the other side stronger. So like some examples that I've been a part of, like I was involved with the organizing around the J20 case back in 2017. I know other folks in the collective have participated as individuals, not necessarily as part of Tilted Scales, but have participated in um, different legal support efforts for different mass mobilizations throughout the years, the Eric King Support Committee, et cetera. It makes sense that it's coming out of the ABC like conference because, like you say, most of the work that Anarchist Black Cross does and has done historically is to give support, like post conviction support to people that have already been given a sentence, are already like behind bars in a lot of cases. <clears throat> and so it makes sense to do the forward thinking of like, how do we A, decrease the amount of people that are ending up behind bars, mm-hmm. B, like decrease the amount of time that people are going to be serving if they are going to do any time behind bars. And like you say, with like the mobilization and popular education element of Mm -hmm. like, what better to stop people from interacting with, uh, with grand juries than to have regular discussions where grand juries are a part of people's vernacular and what people are talking about. And like, no, they're not totally, you may not be able to totally demystify them, but at least, making people aware makes them like readier to be able to just like talking about cop watch, like know your rights type education stuff is going to hopefully get ingrained in people's brains that they can refuse to speak to law enforcement uh, or they can like make those interactions as safe as possible or whatever. I think that's, that's super helpful. Yeah. And I think the defendant's guide like definitely hits on a lot of that. I know like much of the guide talks about, the different aspects that are involved in, you know, various stages of criminal legal process, like what happens pre-trial, what happens, you know, if you take your case to trial, what happens if you plea out, what happens if you're convicted, you know, what are your options maybe for sentencing and how to think about that. That's like one aspect of interpression work is like that demystifying piece. I think the other aspect of it is like helping the folks who are facing charges and their comrades move through that process while still advancing or moving forward with their political goals as well, you know, like at the same time. And sometimes that looks like bringing those politics into the courtroom or into like the way that legal support happens around a case. And sometimes it looks like resolving the case as quickly as possible so that folks can get back to, you know, the other organizing that they're doing. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. And like the approach that was in the defendant's guide and which is also shows up in representing radicals. It's sort of like a, a bookmark of like, this is a thing that you should pay attention to. Obviously it's, it's a lot more filled out in the defendant's guide, but the Venn diagram of like personal goals, political goals and legal goals and setting that out and sort of like working through the process of what that looks like for you as a defendant. What do you want to get out of this? What damage can you legally inflict hopefully on the process of repression to make it, make it not profitable for them to ever try that again, or at least decrease the amount of damage it's going to do in the meantime. That's a really cool model that y'all present. It's very, I like the visuality of it. Yeah. I like that model as well. I'm I'm glad to hear that it like reads well in the defendant's guide. I I think it's been really useful in conversation with folks who are facing charges. Um, One thing that our collective does occasionally is have calls with, you know, groups of friends or support crews who are coming together um, sometimes after like a big action, we saw this a lot last summer, um, to, to help them think through, you know, kind of next steps um, in terms of navigating the criminal legal process. And I also think that thinking about options kind of as containing discrete but overlapping goal areas or um, overlapping but discrete uh, areas of impact is, is a at least for me and seemingly other people, a useful way of being able to visualize 
what options exist, you know, within the context of the system that is fully designed to make you feel like you have no options or the only option is to plea out, you know, immediately. Yeah. Yeah. That's really well put. So as you mentioned, in 2017, y'all published a very timely tilted guide to being a defendant, just as over 200 people were arrested during the January 20th or J20 inauguration of Donald Trump started building their legal defenses. The defendants from that case, the, the over 200 people. This is not in a vacuum, obviously. Following months of resistance at Standing Rock against the uh, the Dapple Pipeline, in which hundreds and I believe thousands of people participated, and a lot of people caught charges. Although it's notable that um, the the federal like felony charges, I think, all fell on Indigenous people. Mm-hmm. Uh, Y'all and AK Press bumped up the publication date in early 2017 and got a lot of copies into into J20, and I'm imagining no dapple defendants' hands. I guess it's always a good time for books defending radicals to come out, which is kind of a depressing thing also. But would you speak about the general goals of this new book representing radicals and who your audience is? Is this primarily aimed at radicals approaching legal work, such as yourselves, or at legal workers who are shifting towards radical approaches at defense, law professors? Should we be sneaking copies into public defenders' briefcases? <laughs> um, sure. I'm happy to say a little bit more. I was involved with the Tilted Skills Collective back in 2011 when the idea for the Defendant's Guide was first dreamt up. But as far as I understand it, the idea to make this, to write this companion book, has always been there. And so, yeah, as you said, the Defendant's Guide is written to anarchist radicals who are facing criminal charges and to their, you know, comrades and supporters and close people who might be wondering how to help them through their process. And by contrast, representing radicals is mostly written to the attorneys who are representing them. So we try to balance throughout the book the fact that some attorneys are going to be, you know, already quite sympathetic, maybe, you know, share a lot of politics with their radical defendants, you know, maybe I'm thinking like, for example, like people at the People's Law Office of Chicago or the CLDC, who are, you know, movement lawyers who've been, you know, devoting decades, you know, their whole career to defending activist anarchist radicals, etc. Balancing the fact that that might be some people's lawyers, but other people's lawyers may not understand at all where their anarchist radical clients are coming from, less familiar with anarchists and radicals and concepts like movement perspective, non-cooperating pleas, etc. Um, the, the other audience that we are hoping might have interest in this book would be law students who are still kind of figuring out uh, who they might represent or how to, you know, maybe bring in some of their ideals about the world into their legal practice. We really wrote this book coming from the idea that, you know, it could be something that defendants or a support committee could give to attorneys and say, here's what you need to read to understand how to provide the best representation for me. You know, or similarly for supporters of defendants who are locked up pre-trial, um, you know, just to have a, a tangible resource that you can hand to an attorney and say, here's what you need to read to understand how to provide the best representation for my friend, partner, comrade, etc. One thing that, you know, in my own experience, being a part of different anti-oppression groups over the years that I've run into is that oftentimes defendants as well as their supporters run up against a variety of tensions, even in trying to communicate with the most and work alongside the most sympathetic attorneys, um, just because the role of an attorney is quite different than the role of a defense committee or group of supporters. So like our first book, the guide isn't representing radicals isn't intended to necessarily you know, be a quote unquote, like how to guide telling lawyers how to do their jobs, but rather a guide to help people think through um, what they might want to achieve when facing charges and, and how their attorneys can focus on that, those legal goals specifically while still um, helping their client balance those other goal areas, personal and political and whatever other 
um, goals a defendant and their comrades might have. It makes a lot of sense. One thing that I've sort of seen in terms of like conflicts come up between lawyers and radical defendants slash their defense community uh, committees or support committees is this ingrained, it, and I think you kind of touched on this, but like this ingrained training in the U.S. legal system, A, the concept of like innocence and guilt is is a strange one. The, also, the idea that like of individual culpability for a process when there's way more dynamics than that, and it leaves out like the social context in so many cases and people are often like stymied from actually presenting social context to sort of flesh out what was going on i i think that that process of thinking through like not obviously like no incident is going to be exactly the same as the next but sort of like teasing the the lawyer who's reading it into instead of just like advocating or speaking on behalf of their um defendant to get them the best deal, which might include some sort of plea deal where they're asked to, you know, name other people or whatever to get their charge down. If if the lawyer's thought is my way, like my goal is to get my guy or my person or whatever as little time as possible and to end this in a timely manner, especially if I'm a public defender and, you know, have like a stack of people to handle and so the sort of like challenges that the book poses where it's like here, you know, here's and and the quotes also, which I want to get to in a bit, but trying to open up this whole world of conversations to lawyers who may be very good at doing their job in the way that they've been trained to do it, that might get them to think about what, I don't know, just the myriad of, of other ways of looking at the outcomes of a trial besides just what charges, what fees, whatever this like individual defendant has to pay. I, I think that's really important. And I, I totally. think the book's interesting yeah, exactly. for that. Um, and that's, you know, you really hit the nail on the head. Throughout the book, we talk a lot about what quote unquote, like best possible representation could mean to radicals. And oftentimes, you know, as we just, as you just said, the training that lawyers get in law school um, really hammers home this idea that they have an ethical obligation and a professional obligation to provide their clients with the best possible representation that they can, you know, which in criminal cases, right, often equates to ensuring that they come out the other side relatively quickly and, you know, with minimal legal consequences, usually, you know, plea deals that are going to minimize prison time, sometimes minimize probation. Etc. And yeah, our, one of the shifts that we try to make in the book, just a bit of a paradigm shift that we try to make, is to help lawyers understand that, you know, as anarchists and radicals who are thinking about, you know, facing criminal charges from a movement perspective, we're going to want outcomes from a legal case that are aligned with our political goals and principles, even if it even if it comes at, at personal expense or if, even if that means an quote unquote unsuccessful legal outcome or a negative legal outcome. And also helping lawyers see that those sorts of outcomes in cases are in line with lawyers' ethical obligations to their clients so long as their clients, you know, fully consent to the terms and have an active role in shaping what their legal defense looks like. And one thing, I think we're going to talk about this more later, but one thing that the book does hopefully pretty well is includes, you know, not just our own perspectives as, you know, three folks who've got quite a bit of experience doing legal support work over the years, but also includes the voices of uh, a lot of movement attorneys who've been, you know, doing movement lawyering some for decades, who really restate that point over and over again that actually you know it's your client and your clients um, supporters and and the projects and movements that they're a part of that really should be like driving the bus and that the lawyer's job is to listen to their clients and help them meet their legal goals while still balancing their other priorities like the whole experience of going to court is a terrible thing it's meant to be alienating and right. terrifying and make you bow before the majesty of of the representation of yeah. of like legal power and the sovereignty of the state to ruin your life. Right. And um, I mean, all the like standing and sitting and all the weird churchy stuff <laughs> that, like, left over from the 
the time of kings and queens. Right. It feels really important to sort of find this space to intercede and say, hey, you're supposed to be this person's like, you got their back. So let's talk about how do you understand what they're saying? How do you understand? Yeah, any anyway, so the glossary. I really appreciate the glossary that y'all provide and some of the key concepts that you're trying to introduce or shore up in the legal work. I guess, can you, I'm going to break this one up a little bit. Could you talk a little bit about the glossary and, and what y'all put in there and sort of what you're hoping? Yeah, um, we decided to make the glossary pretty early on in outlining the book. And our decision to do so was partly to include terminology that unfortunately may not be familiar to every person who might be reading our book. So like different identity terms are included in the glossary. Also, like we wanted to break down what we meant by anarchist and other um, radical tendencies. And we wanted to, wanted to be clear about that. But we also use the glossary to explain yeah, a little bit of these like broader concepts so like movement lawyering, collective perspective. And like politicized prisoners and sure, sure. Prisoners of war and like <laughs> Totally. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um things that, you know, in anarchist subculture might be unnecessary to define in a glossary, but when um, you know, communicating with a lawyer who doesn't have experience working with the anarchist radicals, that particular population, it might be new territory, very unfamiliar. Uh, there's also the quotes that you mentioned, which are interspersed throughout. Uh, and like you, you mentioned already a few, the People's Law Office in Chicago and the CLDC. Can you speak to what the hope was by including direct quotes from people who do legal work as professionals and who work in movement? And sort sure. of the idea of movement lawyering. Yeah, absolutely. So I I know that we wanted to include the voices of movement lawyers, well, primarily because you know we have experience doing certain kinds of anti-oppression legal support work, but none of us are lawyers, and so we felt as though there are some things that lawyers would just be more knowledgeable about and could speak to with more experience. We also thought that that you know by including the voices of many attorneys who had already who are who are you know movement attorneys who, who do represent radicals every day in their professional lives, we could um, shift the conversation a bit so that you know an attorney who is reading the book who maybe is not in that world would feel as though. It's more of a peer-to-peer -peer conversation, as well as the added bonus of hearing from folks with a ton of experience doing legal support. Um, and so by movement lawyering, um, I really mean, like I mentioned, PLO and the CLDC, but movement-centered lawyering really happens when a defendant and their legal team take into consideration the defendant's legal, personal, and political goals in relationship to the political movement of which the defendant is a part. One definition I read recently says that movement lawyering builds the power and capacity of people involved in social struggle rather than the power and capacity of the state and legal system. I like that. So yeah, the movement lawyering, in my mind, is an approach that means not only meeting ethical obligations as an attorney, but understanding a radical client's legal, personal, and political goals, you know, fully when creating legal strategies and an overall defense strategy. And it means, you know, having some mental context for the case itself and understanding how that case situates in a, a broader movement, broader movement, and then using that understanding to build legal representation that is going to align with the client's goals and principles and interests and, and possibly, hopefully, the goals and principles and interests of their supporters and comrades. The other thing I wanted to say was that, you know, a movement lawyering, even in cases where it's, there aren't multiple defendants and even, you know, when we're not talking about collective defense necessarily, movement lawyering really does 
take into consideration other people who might be affected by the outcome of a particular case, you know, and that collective perspective considers the short and long-term political consequences of criminal charges, you know, and takes into consideration co-defendants, affiliated groups, and broader movements when making decisions about legal strategy. The Final Straw is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts, and here's a jiggle from another member of CZN. Hello, and welcome to We Will Remember Freedom, a monthly podcast of anarchist fiction. I'm your host, Margaret Kiljoy. Hello, and welcome to Live Like the World is Dying, your podcast for what feels like the end times. I'm your host, Margaret Kiljoy. Hello, and welcome to the jingle for both of my podcasts. I'm your host, Margaret Kiljoy. You can find my podcasts wherever you get your podcasts or get them from the Channel Zero Network. I really like one of these that really stood out, one of these quotes, and I'm I'm going to read it at length. It's not super long, but Ethical Obligation to the Greater Good by Dennis Cunningham Esquire. Mm. It's on page 91. As lawyers, we have it drilled into us that we owe a duty of representation to each client. The rest of the world be damned. If something would make us hesitate before attacking someone else's interests, our loyalties are said to be divided, and we are supposed to avoid taking the case or withdraw. But wait— Our political clients want and deserve to be represented on a political basis. If a client to whom we owe such unflinching duty demands it, we owe a broader duty to the client's community or activist group to receive input from and account to their community, show solicitude for the welfare of others in it, act in ways that promote the esprit and effectiveness of the community, and take care not to undermine its values or the goals of the client's activism. Call it intersectional lawyering. No adversary has ever tried to pierce the attorney-client privilege because I am met in solidarity with fellow plaintiffs, defendants, or legal supporters. My amazing activist clients have always been my teachers and my comrades, and helping me hone this praxis, and for it, we have all been the wiser, happier, and freer. Mm. I like that quote. Yeah, I like that one too. I think I've said it already, but yeah, one thing that that sidebar that you read from Dennis Cunningham really hones in on, and one thing that we, you know, try to repeat throughout the book is again this paradigm shift from an individual defendant's, um, you know, best legal outcome to more of a collective perspective that reimagines what it means to provide someone with, quote, the best possible representation. And and within that, you know, thinking beyond um, the best plea deal or the best legal outcome. Yeah, and Dennis really says it well in in that quote, thinking through, like, actually, you know, from our perspective, that is what a lawyer should do. And that is what they're ethically obligated. That is the job that they're ethically obligated to do for their clients. You know, many movement attorneys do share at least some or or many of the principles and goals of their clients. But even when they don't, you know, I, I really do feel as though it is the job of any attorney to be able to meet their client from that place and, and be able to provide, you know, client-centered representation that takes into account co-defendants, takes into account broader social, you know, broader struggles. And that is that is their job and that is doing it well. Could you talk a little bit about the introduction of concepts and realities of of support committees into this? Because it it feels normal for me, you know, and for a lot of us, I'm sure, to be like, yeah, of course, all your buddies are going to show up to court with you. and (laughs) They're going to go like TP the prosecutor's house afterwards and like whatever else. But um, JK, what sort of conversation are you hoping will come out of this? What sort of understandings are you trying to bring to lawyers around Defense yeah. committees. And I think it's uh, just to like caveat that too, I think it's really useful that you talk about some of the complications that can come up. Right. Okay. So, like in the defendant's guide, we do talk a little bit about defense committees, AKA support committees. And then by that, yeah, we just mean the folks who show up to provide the political, personal, and legal support for defendants as they move through the process. 
And that, you know, as, as you I'm sure know, that can look a lot of ways. And there's a lot of different names for efforts like this, but all are rooted in, you know, community care and support in the face of systemic oppression or state repression. Some examples that come to my mind would be like the RNC8, you know, the organizing that was done post J20, the Water Protector Legal Collective, and all the other various support efforts that arose around Standing Rock, um, you know, various efforts for a wide range of black liberation, anti-imperialist freedom fighters over the last several decades. You know, the, we could all, re- we could refer to a lot of different, um, you know, formations of or groups as defense committees, support committees, and most many refer to them kind of as something along those same lines. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's the formal organization that kind of takes the reins with providing support, but right, oftentimes it's like our buddies, <laughs> our friends, and, and this informal group of friends, comrades, loved ones tends to kind of hold down um, a lot of the cover a lot of the bases when when folks are facing charges so in the defendant's guide we talk about you know what is the defense committee how to form one what might it do what are some areas of tension that might come up but in representing radicals we really wanted attorneys to view the defense committee or you know just supporters more broadly as potential assets for them to do their job well, um, you know, from the mindset that, you know, attorneys and supporters can work together, you know, uh, separate, have like separate goal areas or separate, you know, kind of lanes that they're driving on to use this bad analogy, but um, yeah, to kind of have separate tracks, but really work collaboratively to provide defendants with a solid way of meeting their political and personal and legal goal. Um, because, you know, too often, in my experience, um, doing anti-oppression work, uh, lawyers view gr- groups, especially groups of supporters, as can view them as, like, you know, threatening or, you know, feel concerned about attorney-client privilege, feel as though political organizing around a case might detract from the legal representation that they're wanting to provide, um, you know, might harm a client's case, might do more harm for them politically and legally than good. And, you know, there's certainly um, legitimate concerns there sometimes, but we really do think that um, if we could demystify some of what a defense committee does for attorneys, many of them might hopefully be more inclined to work collaboratively or at least kind of communicate about their boundaries and, you know, accept that a support committee might mm, take other actions. And and that's okay, so long as it's okay with the folks who are facing charges, because ultimately those are the people who are going to be most impacted by you know, how the lawyer approaches the case and how the support committee approaches the case. Similarly, the book talks about strengths and pitfalls of different kinds of media and sort of like breaks down some different conceptions of different kinds. Um, really proud that we could be mentioned among movement media <laughs> in the book that just delighted me so much. Can you can you talk about like sort of the the things that you touch on and some of the suggested frameworks of approaching media that you make in the book Tours Lawyers? Sure, yeah. Um, Well, again, I want to say that the Defendant's Guide also talks about media and talks about it more from a perspective of, you know, if you and your comrades are wanting to produce media around a case, here's some ideas for doing that. Here's some tensions that have occurred in the past in our experience. Um, You hear some awesome folks who are doing media already to reach out to, et cetera. I think about media as one area where oftentimes an attorney might bristle at the idea that a defendant, even indirectly through a support committee, might put anything out there about a case before um, a legal outcome is reached on it, right? And... In Chapter 5 of Representing Radicals, we talk about how media engagement 
um, might help or hinder legal goals, you know, and some tensions that we've encountered in our experience, and also some considerations for attorneys who are advising their clients and their support committees on a media strategy. But the, the point that we really try to um, make is that ultimately it's going to be up to a defendant and potentially to their supporters of, about what gets said to the media or what sort of media is produced. And that's fine so long as it's aligned with a defendant's legal goals and strategy, you know, and that a defendant is aware of and consenting to the impact that certain media might have on the legal case. And in fact, you know, in my own experience, like, so for example, I was involved with the support committee for C.C. McDonald, who is a trans woman in Minneapolis who um, survived an attack by a white supremacist man outside a bar and was is, was charged with murder after he died. And, and in that particular case, we saw media be tremendously helpful in shifting the public narrative about C.C. and also, in my opinion, had a tremendous impact on the legal outcome of that case. She was offered a plea that she felt she could live with, ultimately, um, and one that was, in terms of legal outcomes, substantially better than, in my opinion, what what would have happened had we not not um, taken a media strategy in that approach, in that particular case. For attorneys who are advising their clients about media, uh, many attorneys are gonna say, you know, don't say anything at all. And that is a fine way of approaching media if the client's goal is to resolve the legal aspect of the case as quickly as possible and with, you know, very little fanfare. Um, you know, engaging with unsympathetic media might not be necessary or effective or desirable depending on the facts, of the, you know, or the circumstances surrounding the case. But however, like I just said, if the client's goal is to shift public opinion about the political circumstances surrounding their case, you know, or even more broadly to shift a public opinion around the circumstances, the political circumstances of the case, such that it may have an impact on the legal outcome of the case, and engaging with, you know, mainstream media might be strategically necessary, or putting out your own media might be strategically necessary, even if it complicates the legal strategy or, you know, makes a lawyer add stress to the defense preparation. And so we really want attorneys to understand that, that there's, you know, kind of separate spheres that defense committees are operating in, you know, defense committees and attorneys are operating in. And, you know, attorneys don't have to talk to the media, but other people might, and that's okay, so long as defendants are consenting to it. Yeah, and that's 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 cool to hear the experience around C.C. McDonald's case. Because um, yeah. there was definitely... I mean, she was fighting such an uphill battle battle with that. Yeah, for real. And, she yeah. was. Yeah, and the early media that came out around her case was horrible. And she was facing first one and then two murder charges, you know, in in Hennepin County where, yeah, I mean, so I, I do strongly feel as though that political campaign and specifically the um, media strategy part of it really did directly influence the legal outcome of that case and then more broadly like influence the community public narrative around self-defense around you know, the intersections of anti-black racism and trans misogyny and the criminal legal system like i really do feel like that media work was very successful um, in terms of meeting its goals and and we were lucky in that case to have um, a very sympathetic attorney who I was not involved in the creation of the media, but, you know, content to let the C.C. McDonald Support Committee do what we did. In uh, 2013, my co one of my co-hosts, William, got to interview Katie Burgess mm -hmm. of the Trans Youth Support Network about C.C.'s case. Cool. I Which, remember when that interview happened. Yeah. Yeah, that was... Um, that felt really important for us to be able to participate in that. I was kind of thinking when you were talking about, before you named CC, I was thinking about uh, Luke O'Donovan's situation in right. Atlanta, where he like defended himself against uh, attackers at a late night party, I think on New Year's, who were attempting to queer bash him. Mm -hmm. um, 
and like being around for for the court hearing that like the actual tri- part of the trial at least and ju- but just like seeing the impact folks in his support committee did a really good job of 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 framing some public narrative around the circumstances because it I can totally understand a lawyer or a legal crew deciding we just don't want to engage we do want to just like get heads down get through this and not like start not become a target mm-hmm. for either reactionaries or for the prosecutors but the prosecutors oftentimes try to frame these like narratives around prosecutions anyway because they don't their job like their literal literal job is to prosecute not to resolve a situation towards justice totally um, right so if they're going to frame a narrative anyway you might as well try to like steer it in a different direction Totally. And I do think, you know, where it gets a little sticky, I think often is it is difficult to talk about, um, you know, the context of a case and the, the politics of it and the ways that power operates within it without getting into the facts of the case. And so it makes sense that lawyers would bristle about talking to the media before you know, they're able to do their job, which is discussing the facts of the case in court, you know, or, or, um, you know, negotiating a good plea deal based on the facts of the case. But, you know, I do think it's, I do think it's possible. And I also think, you know, if someone, you know, especially when we're talking about situations where, you know, the charges might be not very serious, maybe it was a, you know, mass, like a pre-planned mass arrest, where, you know, folks willingly participated in it and are now facing, you know, not very serious consequences, it totally makes sense to talk about the facts. It, it can, it doesn't always have to, but it, it could totally make sense to talk about the facts of the case publicly before a legal outcome is reached, because as, so long as that fits within, you know, defendant's broader political and legal goals and strategies. Actually, to, to pop back to the, the quotes that y'all interspersed throughout the book, just to say it also, I could see it being pretty useful that if a lawyer reads this and they're just, you know, they're radical curious, or if they're going through law school and they're trying to find a way to become a movement lawyer, like it's cool that they they suddenly have like a list of names, a list of organizations that they can either intern with or contact and reach out and say like, hey, I read this thing. I'm having these thoughts, like, can I bounce some ideas off of you? Like, it, it creates more of a, I mean, there's already organizations, for better or for worse, that do, like, varying qualities of jobs from ACLU to, like, the National Lawyers Guild and other groups, or the networks. There are already networks um, that include movement lawyers, but this, it seems like a good tool for networking movement lawyers. Right, we hope so. Are there any topics that I didn't ask about that you want to share on? Well, you've already hit on how this book includes not just our voices, but um, lots of input from uh, movement lawyers, comrades, um, and also, you know, we wouldn't have been able to write this book without conversations with other legal support workers who've been, you know, in it with us over the years. And just like our first book, this book is intended to be an experiment that's based on the wisdom collected from people who've been doing this work for decades. I mean, many of them for far longer than any of us until the scales have been doing this work. So we hope that this experiment can help people fight back more effectively and better survive the brutalities of the legal system. Um, But we don't intend for it to be like, you know, a definitive only way to think about these things. Um, But we do hope that it's useful. And we, you know, would love if it's a resource that gets used and built upon over time. Just out of curiosity, though, are, the idea for this feels very novel. But obviously, there have been periods when struggle has been heightened. And at least in the US that I can think of, like certain decades or certain periods of time and movement eras, when there has been more activity and more agitation and more arrests, like whether it be like the early, like the late 1800s, like during massive labor strikes around the country or uh, the suffrage movement or uh, movements to end Jim Crow or like, you know, the civil rights era, the 1920s, like, you know, communist and anarchist and socialist agitation, the 60s and the long 60s, obviously 
or the clamshell movement. Are there any other prior experiments in this vein that you've heard of that are like radicals with anti-repression experience trying to formally reach out to change the culture of lawyering to, to bring more like lawyer comrades into the fold? This is a big um because I'm really racking my brain. I know that a couple have been with me, but I can't remember them. To my knowledge, there have been other publications that are similar to the Defendant's Guide, but I am not aware of anything quite like representing radicals that speak to the lawyers representing radicals directly. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Yeah, I didn't know if there was like an inspiration that you're like, well, this is like, you know, 60 years old at this point. So not really that applicable, but mm. cool idea. Um, I would defer to other members of Tilted Skills Collective who are more involved in lawyerly land. <laughs> so are you pleading the fifth then? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't know. Okay. Well, how can folks get a hold of the book uh, and keep up on the work of, of Tilted Scales? Sure. Um, so our book is available through AK Press. Um, AK Press offers discounts on books sent to prisoners and also on bulk orders if you contact them about it. So yeah, we really appreciate all the ways that both AK Press and the Institute for Anarchist Studies are helping make this book a more accessible resource. Um, you can... Stay in the loop about the Tilted Skills Collective by checking on our website, Instagram, and his Twitter with the caveat that we're not super active on any electronic platform, mostly because none of us really like them. But we do try to make it easy to find our resources um, because we hope it will help people in their struggles. So our website, for example, does have a link to our zine, which I believe is chapter two of the Defendant's Guide. And then also it has direct links to other media we've produced in the past, as well as some templates that might be useful in beginning to work with a lawyer, um, and specifically around um, navigating collective defense. Thank you so much for having this conversation, and thanks for all the hard work and amazing stuff that you all do. Oh, well, thank you. It was really nice to talk with you. And um, yeah. We are excited to see, um, you know, how this book impacts our movement more broadly. If you appreciate the work we do here and want to support us, here are a few ways that you can do that. Tell others about the show. Share it with comrades and on social media. Rate us on iTunes. Check our past episodes on our website. Links to the streaming platforms and social media that we inhabit can be found at tfsr.wtf social. If you have a local radio station you want to hear us broadcast on, we produce a weekly 58-minute FCC-friendly version and are happy to talk to stations about airing us. You can find more info at tfsr.wtf slash radio. We're currently airing each week on about 11 stations around the so-called U.S. and would love to expand our audiences. If you have some cash to throw our way, you can support our transcription and hosting costs by sending us donations via Venmo or PayPal, or recurring donations via PayPal or LibrePay. You can also become a Patreon supporter and receive thank yous, including a zine a month, stickers, buttons, t-shirts, and more, by visiting patreon.com slash tfsr. And you can also buy merch from us at our big cartel store. More info on all this can be found at tfsr.wtf slash support. This is The Final Straw, and I'm Bursa Goodness. The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at the Final Straw Radio, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee. Located at 610 Haywood Road, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned co-op in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a catalog of Firestorm's books and zines, plus a full calendar of events up at their website, firestorm.coop. My name is William Kunstler.
I met Phil Oakes when he was a witness in the Chicago trial. And everyone that you've seen here tonight in one way or another is part of that trial, but many people were witnesses and defendants who are floating around. Jerry Rubin, who will be on later, you already... Ed Sanders, Phil, uh, Pete Seeger were all witnesses, and so was Phil. And Phil went up to the witness stand with his guitar in a case. It was labeled Exhibit D-147. And I asked him the following questions, and he gave the following answers. Mr. Oakes, will you please state your full name? Philip David Oakes. What is your occupation? I'm a singer. What kind of a singer? A folk singer. Can you indicate what kind of songs you sing? I write all my own songs, and they are just simple melodies with a lot of lyrics. They usually have to do with current events and what is going on in the news. You can call them topical songs, songs about the news, and the developing then into more philosophical songs. Did you have any discussion with Jerry Rubin when you saw him after coming to Chicago in August of 1968? Yes, I did. Can you relate what that conversation was? We discussed the nomination of a pig for president. We discussed going out in the countryside around Chicago and buying a pig from a farmer and bringing him into the city for his nominating speech. Did you have any role in that? Yes, I helped select the pig and I paid for him. Where did you find the pig? We found it on a farm outside of Chicago. Did you find a pig at once? No, it was very difficult. We stopped at several farms and asked where the pigs were. None of the farmers referred you to the police station, did they? No, they did not. Would you state, Mr. Oakes, what if anything happened to the pig? The pig was later arrested with seven people underneath the Picasso statue at the Chicago Civic Center. Just before the arrest, did Jerry Rubin read anything? Yes, he read a prepared speech for the pig. What did he read? Something to the effect, why take half a hog when you can have the whole thing? He announced the pig's name, Pegasus. He said, I, Pegasus, hereby announce my candidacy for the presidency of the United States. He was then interrupted in his talk by the police who arrested all of us. What was the pig doing during this announcement? He just oinked several times, and then he peed. Question, did you ever see that pig again? No, after his arrest, he apparently dropped out of the race. Judge Hoffman then turned to Phil Oakes and said, Mr. Oakes, just answer the questions directly. You are a singer, but you are a smart fellow, I am sure. And Phil replied, thank you very much. You are a judge, but you are a smart fellow too. On cross-examination, a pig-faced little fellow by the name of Richard Schultz, who was the United States Attorney, began to question Phil. And finally, Phil began to chuckle. And Mr. Schultz said, did I say something that's funny? And Phil said, just your tone of voice, Mr. Schultz. It is just your tone of voice. And the judge butted in and said, what's going on here? And Mr. Schultz said, he was holding back a laugh, Your Honor. 
I thought that either I was very homely and he was laughing at me, or I said something that was amusing to him. I wanted to know. I then said, Mr. Oakes is a very gentle man, Mr. Schultz, and he will not laugh at your face. And Phil said, that is true. People cannot help the way they look. His last words at the trial were in response to another question of Mr. Schultz. Mr. Schultz said, you were at the band shell on Wednesday afternoon. Do you remember saying, Hubert Horatio Hogg, the Democratic pig for president? Do you remember using the names Johnson and Humphrey and Richard Little Caesar Daly in a derogatory fashion? And Phil said, yes, I remember. I said that they were the assassinators of the democracy. And Schultz said, just what did you mean by that, Mr. Oakes? And Phil replied, I meant that they were trying to kill everything I believed in. Decency, human love, songs, joy, and freedom. <laughs> Truly were the assassinators of democracy. And the U.S. attorney turned to his chair and said, that's all I have. <laughs>